Humanity moved an asteroid on purpose for the first time in history. Juno flies past Jupiter's moon Europa. A possible mission to boost Hubble and a mysterious blob is orbiting the Milky Way's supermassive black hole. All this and more in this week's episode of Space Bites. Hi everyone, I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy journalist for over 20 years. This is our Space Bites, our short nuggets of space news, all of the updates that you need this week in the world of space and astronomy. All right, let's get into the stories. Dart hits Dimorphos. All right, well, the big news this week, of course, was the successful strike of the DART mission crashing into asteroid Dimorphos. And I don't know if you watched this live. I did. It was it was amazing because NASA started up the live stream about an hour before and they were updating the image every couple of seconds. And for the longest time, it just was this single gray dot in the middle of the image. And then as it got closer and closer, the turned into a few pixels and then many pixels and then it was clearly an asteroid. And then you realize that there was the main asteroid Didymus and its moon Dimorphos. It got closer and closer. And then you saw just like another big asteroid reminiscent of what we saw with with Ryugu with the Hayabusa mission and with Osiris Rex and Bennu. And then the main asteroid slid past the screen and then you saw Dimorphos just get closer and closer and closer and then you got one last frame of the whole thing and then one partial frame with the rest being red and I guess that was the loss of signal it only sent back a tiny little bit home. There's about a 45 second delay from when the spacecraft was seeing the asteroid to when we got the images, you know, thanks to the speed of light, it was a few million kilometers away. And it crashed into the asteroid with seven kilometers per second of velocity. Now, we got the images of the strike over the next couple of days from a lot of different telescopes. There was a lot of ground based observatories, space telescopes watching the event in real time, as well as the CubeSat that was on board the DART mission that had been released a couple of days earlier. And we got to see all of those. I was amazed that that even just like amateur astronomers, like from the virtual telescope who are live streaming this, they saw the impact it was like a noticeable puff of debris come out when dart struck into dimorphous. But then we got more images from the CubeSat, we got images from Webb, from Hubble, like at this point, we've seen a lot of really cool images. And one of the big surprises was the shape of the debris. When you look at it, you sort of expect this cloud of debris, but what you actually got were these weird trails passing through the debris, similar to like when a asteroid strikes the moon and you get these rays coming out of the crater. And this was a bit of a surprise. And there's a really interesting conversation by Phil Metzger on Twitter, who is a space scientist and focuses on this kind of stuff. And he goes into why this was surprising, unexpected, and what it might mean. So at this point, definitely the collision part happened. So now the will this move the asteroid part is up for an open question. We have to wait a couple of weeks or probably even months for the the change in the orbit of Dimorphos around Didymus to add up to the point that astronomers are actually able to detect it. But once they do, then they'll know what kind of an impact pardon the pun that dart had on Dimorphos. Was it significant? Was it negligible? What happened to the spacecraft? Did it plunge in deep into the asteroid? Did it slam against the surface? Was it an elastic collision? Did it uh, transmit only some of its energy into the asteroid? So these are all still open questions. And we're gonna have to wait a couple of months to find out those answers. And this leads to this bigger question. It's like, what's it going to take? If we find a dangerous asteroid making its way towards Earth, do we have the technology to redirect it? And this is that first just question, can we just redirect it at all? And then so you can imagine over the coming years, we're going to see new technologies tested out. What happens if you try to nuke an asteroid? What happens if you try to slam into the asteroid? What happens if you try to paint it? What happens if you try a gravity tractor to pull it around? Which of those techniques is going to be the most effective, the most efficient, 
and Dart was that first step. So congratulations to everyone on the team. It was awesome to watch it all happen in real time, and I can't wait to see what the science results are. SpaceX and NASA want to boost Hubble. Speaking of the Hubble Space Telescope, which is still at work, I mean, it's been operating for over 30 years, it's getting a little long in the tooth, it is definitely nearing the end of its life, not because the telescope isn't operational, but because its orbit is getting lower and lower. And so if you could boost the orbit of Hubble, then it could last a lot longer. And we saw a press conference today from folks from NASA and SpaceX and Polaris proposing that they study what it might take to boost the orbit of the Hubble Space Telescope, probably using a crew dragon, whether it would be uncrewed or whether it be people on board, they're going to do a study and figure out what it might take. And you know, my guess is the answer is it's feasible. I mean, it's a spacecraft going into orbit, it's going to be able to dock with the Hubble Space Telescope, raise its orbit up to the point that it's got a few more decades of survival in orbit. Um, and there's no funding to do this yet. But if there's a really solid proposal to actually do this, you can imagine that the funding will arrive later. I mean, Hubble is so beloved, it is oversubscribed by astronomers. And if there's a way to keep it operational for a few more years, maybe even a decade, I think NASA would jump at the chance. SLS rolls back because of Hurricane Ian. We're pretty much at the point now where weather is going to be the only thing that's going to delay the launch of SLS or some other big problem that no one is was expecting. All right, uh, last week, I said that SLS looked good to go. I liked his chances. But of course, there's always a possibility of weather delaying the launch and boy did weather decide to delay the launch a category four hurricane crashed into Florida Hurricane Ian, of course, and when I'm recording this episode, folks in Florida are still gripped by the impact of Hurricane Ian, it's been terrible. And you know, my heart really goes out to everybody who is in the path of this monster. But NASA prudently decided that it was a good time to roll the SLS back to the vehicle assembly building and take stock of the situation and wait for the weather to clear before doing another launch. Now, this means a delay, a fairly sizable delay. So the next launch window is probably November 1st at this point. And there's a bunch of maintenance issues that NASA is now going to have to do. They're going to have to go and recheck the self destruct system on board the rocket. There are a bunch of CubeSats that are running out of batteries. Of course, one of those CubeSats is the NEA Scout. This is the solar sail asteroid mission that I did an interview with Les Johnson about just a couple of weeks ago. So you definitely want to check out that interview. Hopefully there's no big problems and Nia Scout will still launch as part of SLS and continue its mission to explore an asteroid using a solar sail as its propulsion system. So at this point, we've got another month and a bit before we can see the rocket roll out to the pad again. And maybe this time, they'll be able to launch as long as another hurricane doesn't roll through. So I'll keep you posted. There's a mysterious blob orbiting our black hole. Now, as you probably know, at the core of the Milky Way, there is a supermassive black hole with 4.1 million times the mass of the sun. This is known as Sag A star. And it's one of the two black holes that astronomers have used the event horizon telescope to image the environment around it. But in context, astronomers have been studying the core of the Milky Way for many years, they use many telescopes, one is the ALMA telescope, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. And recently astronomers detected that there is a blob of gas orbiting around the supermassive black hole. So this blob of gas is orbiting around the supermassive black hole at about the distance from the sun to Mercury. So sort of imagine Mercury's orbit, but embedded around this supermassive black hole, it takes about 70 minutes to take this journey once around the black hole. And so it's moving at about 30% the speed of light. What is it? It's probably just a, a piece of gas, you know, there's still leftover gas from star formation at the core of the Milky Way. And bits and pieces of this fall into the black hole from time to time. Uh, just a couple of years ago, 
something like 3.3 times the mass of the Earth fell into the supermassive black hole. And we get this burst of gamma radiation every single time this happens. So right now, this blob is orbiting around the Milky Way and eventually it will be torn apart by the tidal forces and make its way in and release a blob of of gamma radiation. But what's really cool about this is that it is interacting with the magnetic field lines surrounding the black hole as it goes around. And so astronomers are using this blob as a probe to map out the magnetic field lines around the supermassive black holes event horizon, and better understand the forces that are in process. So it's very convenient, both as a tool of scientific discovery, but also we'll get a chance to watch it eventually get torn apart. So it's, it's twofer. One other cool thing about this discovery is that the detection was made, it really looks like this blob is moving face on to us here in the solar system, which matches the discovery made from the Event Horizon Telescope that for some reason, Sag A star is roughly pointed towards Earth. I mean, it's within 30 degrees. But anyway, Webb sees sand in a brown dwarf's atmosphere. All right, it wouldn't be space bites if we didn't have some news from the James Webb Space Telescope. And this time, Webb was used to examine the atmosphere of a brown dwarf. Now a brown dwarf, they also call them failed stars. And they're between say 13 and 80 times the mass of Jupiter. So much more massive than Jupiter, but less massive than the smallest possible star like at that 80 mass range. That's when the smallest red dwarf stars take over and you get true hydrogen burning in their core, fusing hydrogen into helium. The system is located about 69 light years away, and it contains three brown dwarfs. And so with Webb, they're able to examine the atmosphere of the brown dwarf. And that sounds kind of surprising that a that a star like object would have an atmosphere, but it definitely does. And in that they were able to see carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, they were able to see water vapor. But the weird thing that they saw was silicate material, in other words, sand. And so there are clouds of hot sand in the atmosphere of this brown dwarf. And this could be the way they all are, that you get this weird halfway point between a planet and a star, and you get very strange weather patterns and, and chemicals in their atmospheres. So just another really interesting discovery made by Webb. Now, if you like what we do, and you want to support Universe Today being an independent outlet for space journalism, why don't you consider joining us on Patreon. Now, in addition to knowing that you are helping us create all of this news, you will also get an ad free version of Universe Today for life. If you join even cancel, you will have all the ads removed from our website forever, you'll get an ad free version of all of the videos that we do. we changed our format with doing interviews. And so you'll get advanced access to the interviews that we do, as well as joining our discord community and a bunch of other perks that we have available to you. So if you want to join this amazing community, go to patreon.com slash universe today. Jurong looks beneath Utopia Basin. Now, we've talked quite a bit about the Chinese missions as well. And one of the scientific instruments that is on board the Chinese rovers is a ground penetrating radar. Now there is one on board the Perseverance rover, but can only see about 10 meters under the surface of the ground. The ones equipped on the Chinese rovers are able to see about 80 meters down. And we saw the results of this with the Chinese rover that was on the moon, they were able to peer down into the regolith. And we know that at the very top of the surface, the regolith is like this fine talcum powder. But as the rover looked down deeper and deeper and deeper, it saw that the regolith gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually, it's like large chunks of jumbled up rock down below. And so on Mars, China placed the Jurong Mars rover to roam around a spot on Mars that was once an Asian ocean. And the hope of course, is that the rover would look down under the surface of Mars and detect liquid water like some remnant of this ocean that was once on Mars. It didn't. As far as it could tell, there is no liquid water beneath the surface, but that's only to 80 or 70 or 80 meters. 
It could be well below that, but the rover just can't peer that deeply. But what it did find was these layers that are indicative that there were ancient flooding events that happened over and over and over again, just one after the other, laying down material in this region. So while there isn't liquid water today, there was clearly large amounts of water producing big flood events time after time after time. And all evidence of that water is now long gone. So pretty cool that they're able to start to reveal this history under the surface of Mars. Enceladus is even more habitable than we expected. Enceladus is one of Saturn's moons, and it is one of the most interesting places to go in the solar system because we know that it has a vast ocean of liquid water underneath the ice. How do we know? Because there is water vapor being sprayed out into space by these geysers. They're called tiger stripes at the south pole of Enceladus. And thanks to data from NASA's Cassini spacecraft, we know that not only is there water coming out of, of Enceladus, but there's actually hydrogen gas embedded within that water and hydrogen gas is food for bacteria. So you know that there is an additional possibility of habitability under this ice. And then a new discovery has been made again, looking at this older Cassini data, they were able to see that in fact, there's phosphorus embedded in this water again. And phosphorus is one of the more common elements here on Earth, you're made of about 1% phosphorus, life wouldn't be possible without the existence of phosphorus. And so it looks like Enceladus is even more habitable. You've got water, you've got hydrogen gas, and now you've got phosphorus. Like we have really got to get a mission back to the Saturn system, go to Enceladus, land, go below the ice, we got to know what's there. At the time that I'm recording this week's episode, we got a piece of breaking news. And that is that NASA's Juno spacecraft just did a flyby of Jupiter's moon Europa. It came within 352 kilometers of the surface, which is very close. It's roughly the same distance that the closest flybys have been made in the past is only the third flyby to get this close to Europa. And this image is really cool because part of the moon is seen with fairly long shadows. And of course, when you get these nice long shadows, you get all of the surface features revealed so you can see them. So you can see there's like a really big crater right there on the surface. And you've also see these weird stripe formations that have been identified in past pictures of Europa. So what's going on? Well, we don't really know. And Juno isn't really the spacecraft to do it. The spacecraft to really learn more is going to be the Europa Clipper, which is launching in 2024. It's going to arrive at Europa in 2030 and make regular repeated close flybys of Europa. So this is just a tantalizing taste of what's to come when the Europa Clipper arrives in less than a decade. All right, those were all the news stories for today. Now, if you want to find out more about any of the information that I talked about today, we've got links in the show notes down below. You can get even more space news in my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 55,000 people. I write every word. There are no ads and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Josh Schultz and Andrew M. Gross who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us. All right, that was all the news for today. We'll see you next week.